This week I welcome back Mike Dyson onto the podcast, who talks about his continued work with men through his company, The Good Blokes. Now, it's been three years since Mike was on the podcast last, and so what he shares with us in this conversation is many of the patterns and consistencies that he started to see across his work. He talks about the man box, which seems to be this crappy version of masculinity that has passed down generation by generation, that involves a lack of emotional literacy and, and, and a lot of shame and guilt in there as well. Uh, he also talks about how a lot of this can play out and play into the hands of, of, of violence. But Mike also talks about opening up a space for healthy masculinity and what that involves, you know, in terms of men defining what they want to be in, ter in, in terms of their masculinity. This is a great conversation with Mike. He gets very passionate and he speaks really well. There's a lot of wisdom and knowledge that you'll gain from this conversation from his years of doing the work in the men's space. So enjoy, Mike. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. Today, I have the great pleasure of welcoming back Mike Dyson. Mike, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me again. So we were just talking, it's been nearly three years. Yeah. You were at episode 48. Yeah. And we're early 200s now. It's a different world. It is, for both of us. <laughs> So um, last time we spoke, you were doing rites of passage. Yep. I think that was, you were sort of a couple of years into it. Yeah, yeah. And you also had your Chinese medicine practice. Correct. And we talked a lot about that. We talked a lot about um, your upbringing. Yep. And how that shaped some of the work that you did. Mm. Um, but if I'm right in understanding, no more Chinese medicine practice. Yep. All with uh, rites of passage, the good blokes, and doing more men's work. Yeah. How, is this a function of the demand, or is it a function of Mike being more interested in in the men's work? Yeah, a bit of bit of column A, bit of column B. Yeah. Um, the demand has been absolutely uh, massive, and. Uh, you know, leading up to COVID, I was just sort of noting that the, the COVID kind of lockdown happened about 18 months ago, which was around the time I closed my, I closed my clinic and moved into this work uh, full time. But leading up to that, I was just getting more and more and more demand and mm. it was really difficult to juggle the, the two, mm. finding I was away a lot for camps. And I just think my, my passion was more in that area. And I was saying, way. yeah, I was saying yes to everything, which was leaving me you know, trying to treat patients in my clinic, but saying, oh, I can book you in, but I'm not in the week after and three weeks I'm away and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So it's so getting a bit stressful with the consistency of... I had to make a decision one, one way or the other. And you know, I was 15 years a Chinese medicine practitioner and I really loved it. And there's parts of me that really miss it. But, um, <coughs> but yeah, it's, it's been a really exciting journey and, and pulling the pin on the clinic and and hoping that I'd be able to pay the bills uh, yep. during rites of passage camps and men's camps and fathers' <coughs> camps. Um, but the, the demand's been, been huge. I'm sort of turning people away at the moment, which, mm. is, which is a good problem to have. So what's underpinning that demand? Mm. It's, it's interesting. I think there's, there's um, a real appetite for conversations around, around manhood and, and masculinity. I think... There's a lot of people, there's more and more more people who are willing to have the real conversations that we need to be having around masculinity. I think it's yeah. just reaching that point where it's like, oh, we can actually start talking about this stuff now. Mm. Whether that's about, you know, men's mental health stuff, which is something yep. we've kind of swept under the carpet for a long time. It's men's, yep. men's health week this week. Yep. Um, there's more of those conversations happening or whether it's around how we are as men in terms of respecting women and girls as well. I'm getting a lot more inquiries from, from parents of boys saying, how do I have these conversations with my son wow. about consent, about mental health, about all these kind of things. So there's yeah. just a real appetite for it, I think. So who's, who's, what, what are the services you're offering now and who's typically taking those up now? Yeah, so the, the, the Heart of Good Blokes Co. Is, is our Good Blokes Retreat, which is uh, basically a men's retreat for anyone who's interested in, in driving this, this newer, healthier sort of form of masculinity. 
Mm. Um, we talk about a better way to blokes. So blokes yeah. who are looking around their workplace thinking, are we as men at our best here? Yeah. Blokes are looking around our footy club saying, are we, are we really supporting each other um, when we're struggling? These kind of yeah. things. So yeah, whether it's, you know, whether it's, you know, blokes from a corporate environment or blokes from local community groups or, or men who just want to be the best dads they can be or the best husbands they can be or the best boyfriends they can mm. be or brothers, uncles, whatever. How can we unpack this whole masculinity thing? The man box I talk about a lot and, and how, <laughs> like that's, that. yeah, how, that's, how that's formed us and how we can go on to live happy lives and have a really positive impact on other people. Mm. So that's the, the Good Blokes Retreat. And then I do father-son camps. I do a mother-son camp as well. Oh, right. uh, and a bunch of work in schools, helping schools to design really impactful programs so that they can have really good conversations around this stuff with, with boys at their schools. Superb. So um, without giving the whole game away of what yeah, yeah. you do, yeah. what are some of the themes that you're looking at when you open up this man box? I really like that. Yeah, well, the, the man box, there's a study that came out of Queensland University in 2018 called mm. the man box study. People can look it up online. It's really interesting. And they asked a bunch of young men, 18 to 30 year old men, not old blokes like me. Um, <laughs> Old blokes like you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Young Obviously, men. you must be in a different age category to me then. <laughs> um, they asked these, these blokes, how much pressure do you feel to fit that, that traditional stereotype of, of being a real man? And, you know, most men feel a certain degree of that, of that pressure. And the more... And when... Sorry. Yeah, go on. When you say a real man... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what are the themes in that? Yeah, well, when, so I asked, this, I asked this to groups of men and to groups of boys, and they always come back with the same answers. What does it mean to be a real man or to yeah. man up? They talk about being tough, strong, dominant, alpha, in control, don't let anybody disrespect for you, don't show your emotions, don't cry, don't be weak, don't be a pussy, don't be a girl, don't be anything feminine, don't be gay, um, be the breadwinner. <laughs> You know, <laughs> there's a lot of expectations which get in the way of Sounds us. fucking neurotic. Yeah, yeah. And I think all of us as men feel it at some level. There's some guys who are really stuck in that man box and yeah. other guys are like, yeah, I know that that's a thing and I'm, I'm trying to just be my own man and not yeah. feel that kind of pressure. But I think most of us feel a degree of that. So, you know, the Good Blokes Retreat is about unpacking that. Like, how can I just be my own version of myself? Yeah. But there's, there's five major impacts of the, of the man box. One is mental health. Blokes who felt the most pressure to be in the man box, more likely to be anxious, more likely to be depressed, more likely to have thoughts of suicide and less likely to ask for help. Yep. Which is the second piece is around being a lone wolf and not, not being a collaborator, being independent kind of to a fault. And there's nothing wrong with independence. There's nothing wrong with being mm. self-sufficient, uh, but you know, can we actually ask for help when we need it as men? Yeah, can we actually go to the doctor when we need it? Radical individualization. Can we, can we work as a team? Yeah. Um, and the, the third one is around risky behavior. Blokes who felt the most pressure to be in the man box were three and a half times as likely to have been in a car accident, mm -hmm. which is just fascinating, that whether that's around drink driving or risky behavior or speeding or, or whatever it is. Um, and, and then around, around violence, the blokes in the, mm. who felt that pressure were um, more likely to have been online bullying or to be violent with another person physically. Um, and then the fifth one is around respecting women. Mm. Um, there's some, there's some interesting stats around women, men, men who felt the most pressure to be that type of a man were six times as likely to, uh, self-report, um, having made a sexualized comment to a, to a woman they didn't know in public. Right. In the last, oh, I can't remember. So that's... Something like that. So it's mental health. Mental health, uh, help-seeking behavior help -seeking and collaboration. Behavior. Yeah. Um, uh, I've got to go back through the list again now. Yeah. Um, Lone wolf. Uh, risky behavior. Risky behavior. Yep. Yeah. Uh, violence. violence. And then uh, relationships with women. And so mm. that man box affects... I think it actually affects all, all men. We're all grown up with those little messages. And, it, and it's not oh, just yeah. someone saying, don't cry. It's just the looks you get from someone when you're emotional and the way yeah. someone stands you know, a bit further away from you um, on the bus. And I, the, a really interesting one that comes up for me is when, when boys are becoming young men, and the, one of the big topics that's come up recently is around respecting women and consent mm. and these kind of things. Are we actually giving boys the opportunity to learn intimacy and closeness? Mm. Um, because they don't feel like they're really okay to hug their mates, 
to tell their mate that they love them. Mm. Even to be friends with a girl is kind of risky mm. um, because um, you, you feel like you're in the friend zone. And, and there's an insult word that gets thrown around. You can get called a simp for being nice to a girl. There's a what long... Is, what yeah. is simp? What, what? There's a long history on the word. You have to look it up. Right. It's, it's supposed to mean someone who's being overly nice um, uh, to, to, you know, get sexual favours or something like that. But the way it's used in schools, it is like if you're just being nice, if a girl drops a book and you say, oh, here you go and pick it up, someone will call you a simp because that means you're being, being a nice guy rather than being the tough dominant alpha. Right. It's a little, it's a little disturbing that our, that our boys are learning like from each other that it's not cool to be, to be friendly and, and kind. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, you brought those five things out. Mm. Do you see how this all comes together as, as like this self-perpetuating pattern? Yeah. You know, whether it's, because I asked that because, it, it certainly strikes me as I listen to you, you know, e- even, you know, intergenerationally, yep. where, you know, we have, you know, fathers have not traditionally talked about feelings. Yep. Is your, if I remember right, your father was an ex-Vietnam vet. Correct. That's yeah. right. Yep. Um, and that, that raises an interesting question as well. You know, we have gone from a long period of time without actually being exposed to the horrors of war. Yep. So whether that has helped to open up this space for men to be less in the man box. Yep. Because the man box may well have been shaped from fathers or grandfathers. You know, I come from England, so yep. you know, my grandfather who has passed away, uh, were both of them, but they both had experience of army, war, post Second World World War Two. Yourself. Mm. So now we've got that sort of space, but you, you can see how with the, with the rigid nature of this man box of, you know, lone wolf, don't talk about emotions. You know, I, I used the word earlier on and it sounds fucking neurotic, but you can see how it spirals around because if you're not, be, if you're not even being kind to other people, there's bugger all chance you're being kind to yourself. Oh, very little chance you're being kind to yourself. yourself because that's seen as, you know, weak, wet, pussy type behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you, there is only a destination of mental and emotional health problems out yeah, of that. Totally. And plus, you know, um, we're not exactly encouraging emotional literacy. No, we're totally not. You're not supposed to have any emotions, let alone talk about them. Mm. So how are we supposed to breed these, uh, you know, emotionally mature and and kind and caring and, and collaborative and, and resilient men, mm. if we're telling them, you're not supposed to have an emotion, emotion's a sign of weakness. If you have one, don't talk about it. Yeah, how are, we, how are we supposed to be resilient and, and strong if yeah. we're not actually understanding our inner world and how to manage a, a difficult time yeah. in, in our lives, you know? Because ironically enough, I find nowadays, I mean, look, I, I grew up in an English boys boarding school for yeah. 11 years typical Lord of the Flies type stuff. Yep. So, um, yeah. Um, so it was very much sh- shields up yeah, yeah. all the time. Yep. Fuck off. Yeah, yeah. No showing any emotions. But um, what I'm finding more and more is, is as we go through life, you have to process your emotions first before you can get to any sort of rational, logical thought. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and people, you know, there's been this misnomer of, oh, we'll put emotions over here and we'll deal with them later. But I think one of the, I'm finding one of the truths of the human condition is they actually come first. We're driven, we're driven by, we, we think mm. we're quite rational creatures as, as human beings. Yeah. It's, it's actually rubbish. <laughs> Most <laughs> of is. our behavior is kind of automatic, driven by emotions and very much cultural as well. It's like yeah. our our behaviors are in the way we are with each other. So if I ask you how you're going, you'll say, oh, good, thanks, yeah. or something similar, because that's just what we do. Yeah. Um, you're not saying that because you're good. You're, you're, you're yeah. saying that because that's the, the expectation of how we are as human beings. Yeah. So that's why it's tough to change this kind of stuff, because it's so 
ingrained into our culture yeah. that I'll take the car keys and my wife will sit in the passenger seat and you know yeah. and all these tiny I'll little things, things that have me thinking that I'm supposed to be the one who worries about the mortgage and stuff. Yeah. You know, little do I know that she's worried about the mortgage as well. <laughs> yeah. Which makes it sometimes, you know, and it, oh, look, I'm not trying to open another massive rabbit hole because we've got some more to go to yet. Mm. Um, but that's why I wonder sometimes whether calling it mental health is actually a misnomer because it's actually emotional health. Yeah. Yeah. Because men, we, I think we do mental quite well. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, to a degree. <laughs> to a degree. <laughs> but we do a lot, we do a shit ton of thinking. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Do we do a lot of feeling? I would argue. Yeah, and do we have the literacy there? Do we have the, yeah. the vocabulary? One of the first things I do when working with younger guys is like, let's start working on vocabulary. What kind of words do you have that describe the feeling of when you're down and flat? Just yeah. throw them out. Yeah. And then I'll say, what kind of words do you have to describe fear? What kind of words do you have to describe anger? And they throw all these things at me. And I'm like, cool, which one have you felt most of today? And then they're like, oh, it's this, it's this, it's this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you, when you create that space, boys and men, I find are really happy to have a conversation. It's, yeah. just not, it's just not normal in our normal kind of environment. Those conversations don't happen around the water cooler. They don't happen in the, in the lunchroom. We've got mm. to create a bit of a different environment for us mm. to be able to have those conversations. And when we do, I find men actually absolutely love talking about feelings. Mm. I think it's <laughs> when you create... I find with many, many things like this and other, you know, sort of weird and wonderful discussions, if you create the space, own the space, then people are like, oh, well, that looks pretty safe. I'll come in. Yeah. And now it's like, oh, thank fuck, I'm here. Now I can talk about this stuff. Yeah, totally. Which is not rocket science. It's just like, what do we need to be safe here? Like, let's, yeah. let's really respect what people are saying. Let's not interrupt. Let's not, not even give them advice and these sorts of things. All right, cool. What's going on for everyone? Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah, it's relative. There's some, there's some simple tips and tips and tricks yeah. to, <laughs> to get blokes into the space to, to talk about what's really going on. But yeah, my, my experience is certainly blokes actually really want, it's a human need to talk about what's, what's actually going on in our lives, what's hard, what, what our hopes and dreams are. Sometimes yeah, yeah, yeah. it's difficult for blokes to talk about what's really beautiful in our lives and what we really want in our lives as well. And I found, yeah, it's interesting to say that because I found... Um, whilst I was still stuck in the man box, yeah. um, that often, you know, people around me would ask me, you know, how do you feel? What do you want? And half the time I didn't know because yeah. I didn't even have the space to explore it. Yeah. You know, you know, around feelings, you know, being able to coordinate and, and locate, I feel like this and that word actually resonates. So now I've made the connection. Yeah, yeah. And then what is it I want? Well, I don't know, but it feels a bit like this and I don't want that. So let's have some space to explore that. Yeah. And it's like, oh crap, I'm learning something about myself yeah, as yeah. I'm talking, yeah. as I've got a safe space where I've not got to be right, I've not got to be correct. You know, I'm not gonna look like a, you know, make sure you don't look a dick. No, I yeah. can look like a dick if yeah. you want. But if you actually, you know, take a breath and breathe, how am I feeling? Oh, I'm feeling kind of, prickly and hot in my in my ribs i guess you'd call it anger okay cool that's what's driving that behavior cool how do yeah, you want to yeah, feel yeah. i want to feel like this what can i do here but we're not we're not taking that breath we're not taking that pause to realize oh mm. i'm actually reacting here out of yeah. anger or i'm actually reacting out of fear or out of out of sadness so yeah it's practicing mm. taking a breath and practicing building that emotion and practicing talking about it mm. which is which is a you know a courageous act as a man to talk about <laughs> your feelings Yes. So if we flip it on its head, what are some of the hallmarks, of, would you say now, of healthy masculinity? Yeah, well, I think it's about, it's about diversity. It's about authenticity. It's about being who you are. Yeah. So I don't think there is a healthy masculinity. I think, there is, I think the opposite of the man box is just being who you are. Yes. And if you're into footy and beer, great. Be into footy and beer. Because yeah, you're, you're genuinely into, into footy and beer. Yeah. yeah. Not because all exactly. your mates are into footy and beer. Whereas if you're into Tchaikovsky and, and uh, Tolstoy, be into that. And if you're into um, hip hop and, you know, jazz, be into that. Like, like if you're into drawing, draw. If you're into kayaking, kayak. Yeah. Just be your own person rather, yeah. than, rather than us all having to be into footy and beer. Just, yeah. be in, just do the things you want to do and be who you want to be. And, and I think the other thing is around um, 
knowing, for me, a good man, because my company is Good Blokes Co, so a lot of people ask me, what is a good bloke? Yeah, yeah. Um, for it's me- It's kind of going to raise the question, yeah, isn't it? <laughs> and I, and I, still, I still think about it in terms of yin and yang. For me, mm. it's the, the, the yang man I want to be is strong, resilient, dependable, reliable, accountable. Yes. You know, accountable for my actions and, and make good on my mistakes. And on the yin side, I want to be kind and caring and, and loving and generous and, yeah. and humble. And so I'm not all of those things all of the time, but I'm no. having a crack. I'm just, I'm just yeah, trying yeah, to be yeah. the best bloke I can be. So that's yeah. healthy masculinity to me. Yeah, and that, yeah, because it is yin and yang. Yeah, totally. And we do have stuff lurking around in our shadows. Yeah. That we're yet to integrate. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Thanks to the man box, putting yeah, a lot yeah. of stuff in there. Yeah. So yeah. It, but, th- but there's this expectation that you're either being tough and strong, yeah. or you're some kind of a flaky wind. Yeah. And it's like- And, and that's sec- a permanent state. Yeah, it's, it's either one or the other. It's, it's, it's not a zero sum game. You know, <laughs> being emotionally intelligent does not make you less resilient, it makes you more resilient. Yeah. It doesn't make you less reliable, it makes you more reliable. Being kind, doesn't stop you from being strong yeah you know or assertive or having boundaries yeah it's strange that we have this black and white view oh you're either a tough guy or you're some kind of a girly man heaven forbid you display some kind of feminine traits and it's like i i had to put my dog down a couple of years ago i was crying my face off while mowing the lawn i thought this is an interesting integration of yin and yang i'm doing this (laughs) traditional masculine chore of mowing the lawn whilst (laughs) In the depths of sadness at the loss of you know my yeah. best mate of fifteen years, it's like you can have both. Yeah. You, you can be emotional and get the job done. It's not mutually exclusive. Yeah, yeah. Because actually, I, I actually find now that as I've journeyed on, looking at the typical man box type way of functioning, I actually look at it as being quite weak nowadays. Yeah, it's not very. It's not very flexible. It's not very flexible, <laughs> and, and it's. It's quite a house of cards, yeah. which comes down quite quickly. And then obviously, once that comes down quite quickly, if we've not got that emotional literacy or we don't know what to do with these overpowering things that we've pushed away, you can start seeing how then violence ensues. Yeah, well, it's going to break. So, you know, like you, we want to be as men like, like bamboo. You know, you can, build, yeah. you can build scaffolding out of bamboo. It's strong and, and reliable. We don't want to be the kind of wood that breaks when you, when you bend it. And the, mm. the problem when, when we break as men is the leading cause of death in young men is suicide. Yeah, three quarters of suicides in Australia are are men. Yeah, um, which is not help. And on the other side, um, violence. Ninety two percent of victims of violent crime in Australia name the, the perpetrator as a as a man. Mm. Um, you know, sexual violence is predominantly perpetrated by men. Uh, domestic violence is predominantly perpetrated by by men. Uh, and we're we're killing ourselves. It's it's not yeah. it's not a great situation. Hmm. Hmm. And I, I guess again, and regular listen, listeners will go, oh, he's going to bring out that hypothesis again. <laughs> Is that so? I've moved. I've moved to. I'm playing with this hypothesis at the moment. Yeah. That the rising, the rising, um, mental health issues, particularly yeah. around anxiety, depression, and suicide. Yeah. Are to a degree, an appropriate response to an environment that is not healthy. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. So we're like the canary birds in the mine shaft. Yeah, yeah. And if our mine shaft of man box is producing this, then we've got to come back and have a look at it and go, the way we're doing this is just not on. Now, it- why is that? Because we've probably been buying into this mimetic story, which is not really serving us. Yeah. And look, we as, we as humans are really good at buying into mimetic stories that don't really serve us. <laughs> you know, you could blow that out to capitalism and all sorts, but that's not the focus of this conversation. Yeah. But um, yeah, more and more, I start to look at, because the challenge I'm finding at the moment is as we've moved to this more sort of radical, individualized, focused culture that we seem to have, that places an enormous onus on the individual. Yeah. So particularly, you know, if you if you're a man and you're having these weird thoughts of, you know, potentially sitting in the car with a hose coming in or or hanging yourself or something like that, that's all going to be scary 
and that's all going to be like, oh, there's something wrong with me. Yeah, so I won't talk about it and I won't ask for help. Yeah, yeah, because we're also issue. not, we're also really good at not going to the doctor for the slightest things at the yeah, same yeah. time. Yeah. So, so then, you know, with this extra focus on, you know, over individualization, it's easy for us to then go, oh, there's something wrong with me. Yeah. Where it's like, no, there's actually nothing wrong with you. Yeah, yeah. It's the way you're doing this. And the way you're doing this is because of this bigger yeah. man box type culture that we yeah. seem to be moving around in. The cultural expectations on men and the world that the fast paced, busy world that we live in, there's no break for our nervous systems. We go from working 60 hours a week to doing the laundry, to scrolling through Facebook, to watching Netflix, to you know, not getting enough sleep and then straight back to, mm. back to work again. And we've, we've you know, lost a lot of that sense of of community in our lives you know um human connection is a neurological need there was mm. a um book that i read recently by uh, vivek murti i'm probably pronouncing his name mm. wrong he was the uh chief uh, surgeon general of the u.s like highest ranking medical officer in the u.s at the end of his tenure he wrote a book about what he considered the most um pressing issue facing the u.s medical system which is human connection Yes. And he talks about how neuroscientists have identified three levels of connection that we need. We need friendship. Yes. We need a common sense of purpose. And we need a deeper emotional connection. We don't, when we don't have that human connection, it can be as dangerous, social isolation can be as dangerous as smoking 15 cigarettes a day yes. to our physical health, not just our mental health, mm. like actually the impact on your heart. So imagine the damage it's doing to our our mental state of well-being, this feeling of, of mm. isolation, which, you know, many of us on, on some level are feeling more and more and more than we did, you know, 20 yeah. or 30 years ago. And, and often, I suppose, it's difficult to put your finger on it in a busy life yep. where we've got these devices yep. that make us feel connected. Yeah, yeah. You know, I can FaceTime mum and dad in England, yeah. but that's not me being with mum and dad. Yeah. And, yeah... And yeah, it can leave you feeling quite hollow inside. Yep. And then all of a sudden the joy drips out of life and then you start doing weird and wonderful things to try and get a buzz. Yeah, yeah, totally. And the, the, the interesting, you know, the, the spike in anxiety and depression since, you know, what was it, 2007 hmm. when the iPhone was invented? <laughs> Probably. But was, was that, is that a cause and effect thing or did we just jump onto these iPhones because we were already feeling incredibly disconnected for each other? Mm. I think it's actually, once again, it's a bit of column A and a bit of column B. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. We like those things because we're already feeling disconnected and they certainly don't make, you know, there's some friends that I have on the East Coast that I wouldn't connect with otherwise. So there's yeah, yeah. really wonderful things around modern technology, but they they don't make me feel connected on a really deep, nourishing level. It's like the no. difference between having a burger from um, McDonald's versus having actual real food. Like, it doesn't, doesn't leave me no. feeling fresh and healthy and nourished afterwards, you know? Yeah. It's, it's junk connection that we get on, on social media. Hmm. Hmm. So what's, um, what's some of the key themes that you're really personally resonating around? at this moment at the moment um yeah well i mean men's health week we always start to think about men's mental health and um uh what we what we can do to be part of the the solution there um but the uh, the big one that's been in the in the news for me recently and a lot of um parents of boys are asking me about is how to teach boys about respecting women and mm. and consent and these kind of conversation so that's been the the biggest one that's come up in some of the schools that I work with and on father-son camps and mother-son camp the mother-son camps a beautiful opportunity um, we do that um, we'll do that in December's the next one we'll do it again twice next year for boys in year sort of eight and nine and they get a chance to actually hear the stories of of women from mm. from the from this community and I think it's actually a rare thing for boys to really hear what's going on for girls and women. Mm. You know, I often say 15 year old boys aren't the, um, the key target market for feminist literature, for feminist mm. podcasts. Like they're not gonna go out and, and buy Clementine Ford's new book. You know, they're no. just not. 
Um, so if we don't give them a chance to hear the stories of women and girls, they're never gonna know what it's like. And conversely, I think it's super valuable for everyone to know what it's like being a, a, a 15 year old boy, being in a school where there's this pressure to be tough, dominant, alpha, strong, cool, um, and to not be a simp, to not be kind and, and yeah. respectful and, and, and thoughtful in those cases. It, so it's like, it's a really unhealthy environment that they're um, growing up in. So yeah, consent and respecting women is the, is the big sort of hot topic at the moment. And something I'm really passionate about, I'm a father of two daughters as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I have great relationships with, with a lot of women in my life and I really want them to feel safe and respected uh, and valued in the world. And I think a lot of them aren't feeling that way, you know? Mm. So I think we're in a position as men, we can, we can do something about that. So those are the sort of blokes that I feel are coming, you know, being attracted to good blokes co at the moment are blokes who are like, oh, how do I do something about this? How do I have this conversation with this bloke at work who is being incredibly disrespectful? Mm. How do I have a conversation with this bloke at work who might be really struggling and it's coming out as a, aggressive towards you know women in the workplace and and whatever else that might look like. So that's the big kind of that's the big hot button mm. issue I think at the moment. Mm. And I suppose with all the coverage mm. in the press of recent, these are quite hot topics. Yeah, and there's a lot of parents out there who are like, oh, my boy could grow up to hurt girls and women, and and I don't I don't want him to do that. And like I talked about before, like this, are, are we preparing boys for, you know, beautiful, intimate relationships? I mm. think we want, we want our boys, I want young boys to grow up to have a beautiful, tender, gentle, kind, caring relationships with, with people that they're intimately involved with, but also, you know, girls and women in their workplace, in their communities and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I just don't think we're preparing boys for that, we're not we're not telling them that intimacy is okay for mm. them. I call it the intimacy gap. Mm. I might have to write a book on it, or TED Talk, or something like that. Because <laughs> mm. where there is gap, then you fill a void with rubbish. Usually. Yeah. Well, well, what they're filling the gap with is the the average <laughs> the average age of first exposure to pornography is is eleven. Oof. And the, the average age where boys are starting to use it uh, regularly is 14. Right. So like regular use of, of porn at the age of 14, like is that teaching you how to, how to have respectful relationships? I don't think so. No. They're learning about this stuff from their mates and from the internet. It's like there's a lot of conversation our boys need to be <laughs> That's having. blind leading the blind. Yeah, that is, yeah. yeah. Totally. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think, look, I'm just thinking back to the first time I encountered pornography. Yeah. And it was, yeah, well, look, it was a magazine. Yeah, right? it was and different it, back then, And it was right? just ladies with kit off, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and you'd read the stories and even they had a, an element of, <laughs> how should we say, uh, fake romance, something yeah, yeah, going yeah. on in there. So yeah. at least it was like a story in it. Yeah. Not just two people come together. Bang it. And there's a bit of your imagination in there, whereas Correct. now what you're seeing on the screen is... Leaves nothing. Yeah, leaves nothing to the imagination. And it's, it's mostly not kind and caring and loving relationships that are, that are displayed in, in porn. It's a certain, a certain way of being. It's a, mm. it's a man box type of a, a relationship, you could say. Mm. If you want to call it a relationship, that's probably not the word for it. Yeah, interaction. Interaction. Transactional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so how do we move from transactional towards yeah. mutual benefit? So one of the big things that I think it's really valuable to ask our boys is, if you're having sex, how do you want the other person to feel? Mm. So rather than consent being framed as, how can I get what I want uh, without getting in trouble? <laughs> you know, right. is, is this other person okay with me doing something to her or him versus, oh, what do they want? How can we have a good time? How can everyone be winning here? Yeah. Because when I ask boys, you know, how do you want the other person to feel? They'll, they'll say, oh, I want them to feel safe. I want them to feel respected. I want them to feel cared for. I want them to feel good and come back for more is a, is a common one. That's <laughs> Which is, you know. That shows a bit of foresight. Um, and then there's, there's a whole bunch of other boys who say, I don't know, I've never thought about that question before. Yeah. And that's the issue. If, we, if we're not thinking about how we want the other person to feel, uh, then you're going to run yourself into all kind of trouble. 
because mm. then you're just entering this consent consent conversation going i want this are you okay with this and and that's where the gray area starts to come whereas if you're going into a sexual relationship going what do you want how do you want to have a good time here what do you want it to look like mm. um do you like this or do you like this then you know the consent conversation becomes a heck of a lot easier mm. Mm. Do you think, um, so I always get concerned that, um, how do I put this? There's, I understand why we need to um, focus on having these conversations with young boys. Yeah. Right. Yep. And while they're at school, mm. I get it. Right. Yet, when you leave school and, you know, School can be this lovely cocooned environment. Yeah. But then you go to the outside world. Say you go and do an apprenticeship yeah. or something. Yeah. Then you're into full exposure of the man box yeah, type. Yeah. It ramps right. up after you leave school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and and there's not many places to come back from, yeah, <laughs> from yeah. it. You know what yeah. I mean? Because um, now you're in the, you know, it, you're in full ma man box workplace. Yeah, you know now it's the expectations of things like you know pubs, clubs, booze, yeah, and and all of that. Friday Ivo drinks rolling into all sorts of yep. awkward stuff on all, St George's chair. Yeah, all of that <laughs> sort of stuff. Um, so look, I always have this challenge with yes, I understand that we need to educate kids because it's you know at some point if we consistently do that, they will, if not bludgeon their way through yeah. over a period of time. Yeah, right. But at the same time, sometimes I wonder, you know, is it or would we get to where we want to? And let's just say where we want to get to is um, a, a masculinity that was more like you described earlier on. Yeah. If we also really focus at, I don't know, let's say that sort of 35, 45 yeah. type area where because it this probably brings in almost the concept of elderhood yeah um because you you're going to have this bunch of 20 year olds who've come out of school having this traumatic experience of having to leave the lovely cocoon of school and come to work yeah right who can start to per perpetuate a whole lot of weird and wonderful behaviors but ultimately it, it's going to be this next group which is kind of our age yeah yeah where we can look around and go, that's not fucking acceptable. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't do that, you're out of the job. Because by this point, we have the responsibility and the authority to be able to do that. Yeah. Which then makes the transition for the kids coming out of school much more gentler. Do, do you get where yeah, I mean? Yeah, totally. Because sometimes, you know, and, and look, I'm totally, I'm, I'm thinking about this more pragmatically. Because I've met lots of people and they always go, oh, you know, we need to educate the kids, we need to educate the kids, we need to educate them. And we do. Yeah. But we also need this, like, middle tranche to be educated so it is easier for the kids. Otherwise, the kids are almost like, I have this vision now, of just like, you know, um, war, <laughs> war zone. Just send the kids in, send the kids in. Yeah, and there's yeah. enough kids in there and the, some of them will be lost on the way and finally they'll get to the opposition post. Yeah, do, yeah. do you get where I'm going? Yeah, totally. And I think the, I think the key thing there is like leaders um, need to be embracing a healthier form of masculinity. So there's a lot of, you know, you know, after you, whether you go through university or apprenticeship or whatever, when you go out into the workplace, uh, how many workplaces in Australia have really healthy cultures around around masculinity it's like you look at the number mm. of uh, female ceos and you know there's more what was the stat that came out last year there's more there's more ceos in australia called david than there are female ceos right which is, <laughs> which is a little bit you right. know it's slanted it's a little bit one-sided yeah. you could say so are we making room for women in leadership positions mm. are we making room for anyone who is not hyper masculine in leadership positions what what we actually find is that is that good leaders have what we call those traditional feminine traits. They're, mm. they're collaborators, they're collaborators, they're listeners, they're, they're empathetic. Mm. Um, so what kind of culture are we creating in those workplaces that kids are going to after they leave school? Well, that's, 
that's up to middle-aged white men. That's our gig. So <laughs> you know? that, that is bestowed upon us. Yeah, yeah, that that's, that's, our, that's our chance. Like we're often in those positions of being the, the small business owner, the, the board member, or all, all of those positions. Mm. It's like it's our opportunity here. And it's actually, it feels really good to take responsibility for this. We don't have to be the ones who are the blame and we're not the mm. cause of all of the problems. We didn't, we didn't create the man box ourselves. We didn't, no, no, no. We didn't build the patriarchy. We're just, you know, being put in this it, position. It was well-groomed when it was handed it was, to us yeah. surreptitiously. <laughs> yeah, so now that I'm the head of this business with 200 employees, um, because of my privilege as a, as a healthy white bloke in, in part, probably because partly I worked hard and probably because I'm a smart bloke and probably because I'm a bit ruthless and probably because I knew some of the right people, Okay, well now I'm here. What am I going to do about it? How am I going to include other people in that? Yeah. How am I going to make it a really good environment for healthy young men and, and healthy young people of all genders and, and diversity? Um, because diverse workplaces are, are you know, effective and efficient and productive and profitable workplaces mm. because you get to hear from a lot of people's different sort of perspectives. So it's a real opportunity for us as, as white blokes to, to learn and lead and, and create really healthy cultures, whether that's, like I said, at the footy club or with your mates or, or in your workplace or wherever that is. Hmm. Hmm. You see where, you see my point though. It's because I, I see often, you know, it's almost like this regret. Oh, it's not happening for me. We need to put it all into the kids. It's like, well, it can still happen. For yeah, you. yeah, totally. And, and, in, totally. and in actual fact, if you want the kids to inherit a workspace that's great and, and it isn't like what you went through, then the responsibility, responsibility is even bigger on you yeah, to yeah. help shape and make the space for them to come into that. Yeah, it's awkward. Not just, oh, I'll tap out. Yeah, yeah, it's, it sounds hard and it's awkward to lean into it, but it's actually incredibly rewarding. Yeah. And that, like the youngest guy we've got booked into the next retreat is 18. The oldest guy we had on the last retreat was 76. Yeah. You know, this is, this is for all men, this kind mm. of stuff. We can all be, you know, the majority of blokes that are showing up are in their 30s and, and probably into their 40s. Mm. Um, but it's really, it's, it's, this is for any of us to, to think about. How can we all be part of, the, part of a better world here where we as men just get to be ourselves mm. and, and women and girls get to feel respected and, and safe and valued? It's like, mm. I want to live in that world. Mm. Why don't be part? Want to be part of the yeah. solution? You know, we're not. Yeah, I guess um, not even feel safe. Safe's just a given. Mm. What should be? Yeah, <laughs> not 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 a feature. Yeah, just a given. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, totally. It's it's not a high bar we're setting. Like we just want people to feel safe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Safe and trust. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Base level of of adequacy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. It's, it's sad that, the, that what the stories that we're hearing more and more and more is that women just aren't feeling a basic level of safety in the world. And yeah. it's like, we can, we can be part of the solution here. We can, we can choose to feel, oh, I'm, I'm not that guy. I, I'm not a rapist. I haven't caused any of that problem. It's like, well, that, you're, not, you're not part of the solution, mate. But you're not, you're not helping to fix the issue by saying, yeah. oh, it wasn't me. It's yeah, like, yeah, well, yeah. that's great that it wasn't you. Yeah. What are you going to do about it? Because if the stat, yeah, because yeah, the stat, if the stats are, you know, I, don't, I can't remember exactly what they are, you know, one in five ladies has, has encountered X, Y, or Z. It's easy yeah. to go, yeah, well, four in five don't. Yeah, yeah. It's like, well, but what are the four in five doing? to make that not acceptable, the, the, the one not acceptable. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to... Yeah, what are, the, what are the, uh, the healthy men doing out there to, you know, to call the other blokes out? Call, call them up, we like to say these days, rather than call them out. Rather than calling bad behavior out, call them up towards a better version of who we want to be. It's like, because most men, like when I, I, I go into uh, school workshops and I create a list for boys. Like, who do you want to be? What kind of man do you want to be? Um, and they say, oh, we want to be uh, dependable, reliable, resilient, uh, mm. hardworking, fun, funny, humorous, humble, caring, loving, kind, yeah. generous. Like, all of the stuff comes out. A whole rainbow. <laughs> yeah. The boys want to be all of the character traits that any human being of any gender wants to be. Yeah. Um, 
but there's just a bit of stuff that gets in the, in the way and we, we kind of learn that being tough and alpha and pushing other people around is how we resolve our problems. Mm. In terms of resolving our problems, the, James Gilligan does a bunch of, has done a bunch of research for years in the UK and the US, reckons the primary cause of male violence is shame. It's men not feeling man enough, men feel like they're being disrespected and pushed around and they're being violent towards another person to regain a sense of control, control. in their lives, regain a sense of power. Yeah. So, so if we can avoid shaming men for not being man enough, we're, we're a, yeah. a long way towards a solution. Hmm. And hmm. when you think about it from a male suicide perspective as well, it's when, if you think about shame, it's when people start feeling like a burden that they're in real trouble. Yeah. And then they're sinking. That's, that's the red flag. Then they're sinking. That's one of the red emotions. flags. Yeah, yeah. So if we, can, if we can dissolve the shame of not being man enough, we end up with happy, healthy blokes who are okay to look after themselves and are just being kind, healthy collaborators mm. to a healthy community. You know? mm. well, I can certainly see, listening to you, how if you're running the man box, modus operandi, and, you know, like, life hasn't been easy. Yeah. Over the last 18 months, yeah, to yeah. say the least. Um, a lot of things that we use as external coordinates to shape our identity and maintain our identity and who we are and how we do things, as well as just there being general uncertainty in the world, where I've found the best thing to be able to do at times is just to be able to sit back and go, well, I don't know. Yeah. I genuinely don't know. Yeah. I have no idea how this is going to map out. To, and to say that I don't know is not a highly revered man box uh, no. trait. To, to admit that you don't have the answer <laughs> yeah. is, is, takes, takes courage. Yeah. And to be honest, life is, you know, if COVID or no COVID, life, life is pretty bloody chaotic and confusing and totally. volatile and uncertain and complex. Yeah. And, 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 and to, so, so yeah, that met by an operating system. Yeah, it's a little wonder, you know. I need to be in control. Yeah, yeah. Really? Go for your life, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of what? <laughs> yeah, so anything that, anything that regains yeah. that sense of Yeah, that's shame, you know. Control. Once we get down to shame and guilt, you're, you're at the right base level of the emotional experience, yeah. aren't you? That's the deep. Well, shame and guilt's interesting. So Brene Brown has an interesting definition of the difference between shame and guilt. So shame, um, shame is that feeling of I'm a bad person. Yeah. So it's whereas, very much internal. Yeah. Whereas yeah. guilt is I've done the wrong thing. Yeah. Which is which is actually drastically different because yeah. when we feel that one's sense an action, of, one's a yeah trait. When I feel when I feel bad about myself, I'm a bad person because I have lost my job. Yeah. then I potentially will strike out again or blame other people. That, so that's a, a, a key red flag when we're looking at boys mm. growing up or, or healthy male behaviour is, is blaming other... That real need to blame other people comes very often from shame and it's mm. often associated with that wanting to control others and push mm. other people around to feel powerful again. On the flip side, guilt, I've done the wrong thing, well, how can I take responsibility? How can I be accountable? And how can I put it right? Yes. That's a, you know, when, if, you, if you want to have a difference between unhealthy masculinity and healthy masculinity, it's probably guilt versus shame. Yeah. If I feel guilty, I will take responsibility and be accountable for my actions and do something better next yeah, time. Because I still know I'm, a good, I'm, I'm in, at the core a good bloke. Because at the core, I'm, I'm having a crack and I'm trying to be a good bloke. Whereas yeah. shame, I feel like a bad person. I'm going to try and blame other people out and push some... some Yep. person around and make myself feel better and then generally into a spiral of anger and cloak all of that and yeah, yeah 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 and then i hurt someone and how am i going to feel about that oh i generally don't feel that great because i've hurt someone but oh it was probably your fault anyway yeah. so i'll push so, you around again and so it's going to spiral the yeah. shame and then you're fired uh and it's like oh I'll find some other employee oh why do why are these employees continually being such idiots i keep having to fire them it's like oh, maybe the problem's you mate yeah 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 <laughs> well, let's go home drink 20 beers and then yeah yeah. Oy, oy, oy. Mm. Um, as you've gone further into this work, what have you learned about your own masculinity? Yeah, so <coughs> it was interesting. I mean, you said before, it's like 
now that I've learned about the man box, the, the more I've gone into this work, the more I've realized it's got its, it's, got its tendrils around me, you know? Yes. I, I've been aware of this stuff for, I've been working in this area for six, seven years now. Um, and, you know, I learned about this kind of stuff. I was never like a massive alpha male anyway. I don't have very big biceps and I can't lift super heavy things. Uh, <laughs> because that is a defining characteristic of an alpha male. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I've never been... I into, love that. Even yeah. you just stereotyped. I've never been into earning, you know, bucket loads of money. I thought, oh, yeah, I'm not really a big man box guy. But the more and more I get into it, the more I realise... For me, the big thing is about being a workaholic. I right. learned from my dad. My dad worked really hard. He wasn't around a lot when I was um, when I was a kid, right. um, and I have a real problem in in taking on too much work and working yeah. too hard and not spending enough time with the people that I love. Like the the most valuable uh, thing I have in my life is my relationships with my wife and my kids and my my friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and why do I not make them a priority? Uh, when I've already got enough work on, why am I taking on more oh, work? Yeah. Because I don't feel like I am successful enough and, and man enough unless mm. I am working really hard. Mm. So, yeah, my name's Mike. I'm a workaholic. <laughs> and that's how, that's how it manifests in, in me. You know. We're at a WA meeting now. <laughs> <laughs> Seven snap. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how, yeah, th- there's obviously that very... Yeah, I mean, look, we, we, through this conversation, have talked about these very open and overt traits of man boxy alpha males. Yeah, yeah. But then there's this other stuff, like you say, that, that comes in yeah, yeah. quietly. Yeah, the sneaky I need stuff. to be busy. I need to be doing the thing. I need to be... Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's my version of it. That's, that's the part that I struggle with. But I think everyone's got their own sort of... Yeah. Everyone knows it. You know, they, they talk in that study, they talk about 67% of men feel a significant pressure, but they rated them on a scale of one to five. I think everyone knows it. And I think yeah. everyone, everyone feels that, that pressure. It's just a question of how, mm. how strongly we feel it. Mm. And how, much, how able we're going back to that pause and that emotional intelligence thing. It's like, how able are we to take a breath and go, oh, how am I being here? Am I reacting out of this, this need to be right? Mm. This need to be the boss? This need to be the alpha? Um, or am I reacting out of what's the best thing for everyone here, you know? Mm. How have you, um, have you noticed much between the relationship between the man box type of running things and the relationship between that and drinking booze? I think, I think, you know, the traditional stereotype of a man is a man who drinks beer. You know, you, you're not sipping, you know, fancy uh, <laughs> other types of things. You, you drink whiskey and you drink beer and, and other things are, you know, not so much okay. And I'm, I'm not much of a drinker at all. I, I drank pretty heavily in my earlier years mm. and, and um, haven't really been a drinker for many years. And I've... Yeah, I've had interesting, strange looks from, you know, alpha males around, oh, what, what's wrong with you kind of thing. It's like, mm. uh, it, it's interesting the, the pressure that we, that we feel as men to, to just have a beer in your hand, to mm. be uh, accepted as, as, as okay. It's, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of pressure there around, mm. around alcohol to be able to, you know, to be able to hold your booze, to be able to drink lots of it and to be, to be always up for it mm. is... Um, yeah, is the is the expectation there? I think because mm. I certainly grew up uh, playing rugby, mm. so rugby and beer go hand in hand, or at least they did during those amateur years. Yeah, yeah, um, they did for me at the footy team. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and you know, as as I looked up to the guys that were playing, you know, top quality rugby, and 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 particularly, you know, dad and friends and stuff like that, they were drinking a lot. Maybe it's more of a function of being in the UK, but that's not worlds apart from Australia either. Yep. And again, I wonder, so it's been quite a period of time since I've drunk. Yep. Um, rather than calling it, um, I've stopped drinking or I've been sober for X amount of months. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've developed the phrase which sits really well. Um, it was X months ago that I moved past drink. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. I've, I've moved beyond it. I've moved past it. Yeah, yeah. Right. But um, that was a really interesting experience that brought up a whole lot of stuff. Because with them, I mean, look, just with the clarity, it was great. Um, but it brought up more and more stuff around, well, why do I drink? Yeah. What, why do, where, where did this start? How did I get into this? You know, as you start to enjoy the benefits of not drinking, you say, why did I, what? And, and there again, like you say, growing up, you look at, because we grow up, we, we want the approval of other men. We want, yeah. we ultimately want to know how to be a man. Yeah. Right. Because nobody gives you the instruction manual. No, right. and, there's a, and there's a big gulf between, you know, your body feels like a man's body when you're 15 and 16 versus question I ask a lot of blokes is when did you first feel like a man? Yeah. And not many of them will say 15 or 16. No, no. Most of them will say 30 when I had kids, when I became the boss, when I was yeah. married or, you know. I would put around you know, 44, 45. Yeah, there's a, there's a big gulf yeah. there, you know. That's when I felt like a grown up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> grown up man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, so again, you know, we grow up, we, we, want, we want to know. We, w- we actually want, you know, as you said, we want to be connected to other men. Yeah. So we will do things to be what they are doing so we can connect. And I guess one of the things for me was drink. Yeah. And, and you, you know, like you say, you grow up, you know, and, and in the conversations you, you hear that the guys that drank a lot and held it and were still able yeah, to yeah. function or do something, you know, yeah. were highly revered within yeah. the conversation. And so... Totally. The, the things that are revered in the conversation are the things you go, that's what I need. Yeah. Unconsciously, it's like, they're the things that I need to do. So, so where else are, are boys getting good, healthy role models from? You know, they're back in the day, you go back a couple of hundred years, they would have been out in the field working with adult men and quite possibly adult, adult women. Um, but nowadays, there's, there's just not a lot of healthy male role models mm. surrounding them. There's a few male teachers in the, in yeah, the schools. Yeah. I work with a lot of great male teachers, but um, you know, are, are they having a lot of healthy conversations around manhood with their uncles, mm. with their dad, with their granddad, with their dad's mates, with their mates' dads? Mm. And it's like you know, the way teenagers are kind of separated from, from men these days. They're just not having enough chance to Mm. see them see men in their in their natural habitat you know other than oh it's on the weekend dad's on the dad's on the piss again he's he's sunk six beers yep that's what blokes do yeah 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 and he's now emotionally unavailable yeah (laughs) yeah yeah because um yeah it's interesting that it is um because the other trait that I've sort of noticed is that sometimes, and particularly when we consider, you know, the large FIFO culture that we have here, but I sort of, I sort of noticed it in the UK, um, probably from boarding school, but also as well, that there was this sort of underlying theory, uh, underlying expectation that men go away and then they come back. Yeah. They, whether it's to work, to yeah. war, to something, men go away. Yeah. And then they come back. I was like, I'm doing this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was yeah. like, why, why am I going away? It's just the, the patterns, like I was saying before, it's like it's in our culture. It's just a kind of an expected thing that we, that we do. Yeah. And if we don't have conversations to, or some kind of contemplative processes to unpack that, like mm. who do I want to be versus, you know, what are all these expectations I'm feeling? Like I just, mm. when I finished school, I was like, oh, you just go to uni. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's just what people do. My yeah. dad, my dad said to me, he goes, don't go to uni if you don't know what you want to do. I'm like, uh, yeah, whatever. And just the, the expectation of the world that I was in, everyone yeah, was trying to go to uni. So I'm like, belt. I went to uni. I wasted two years mm. studying random stuff that I was vaguely yeah. interested in. Ended up with a hex debt of thousands of <laughs> dollars. Yeah. So I'm like, because that's just what people did. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's really valuable for, for every young person and for every older person as well to be having conversation around, who do I actually want to be? What do, what yeah. do I actually really want to be doing in my yeah. life? Rather than just being sucked along by the tide mm. of, of, you know, what's expected of me and what other people are doing and what I'm seeing on social media and, 
yeah, if we don't have time to unpack that, that stuff influences us, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we can get past role modeling and into, dare I say, wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Sharing that. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a great place? And, and one of the things I think is hugely val- valuable for young men is to hear the stories. I talked about them hearing the stories of women, hearing the stories of men. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and with some level of vulnerability, if they can hear a, a, a grown adult man who they all look at as successful and has their life together, whether you have your life together as successful or not, that, that's how they'll look at you. Um, if you can share a story by saying, oh, I actually really struggled when I was your age and this was what was going on yeah. for me and this is what I was confused with and this is what was difficult. And mm. I'll go, oh, yeah, right. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't know that other just, men struggled with things yeah, yeah. because just no one's talking about it. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. thought you just had it sorted from the start. Yeah. It's fascinating. When I, when I ask a group of men, it's like, put your hand up if you've been really angry at some point this year. Everyone puts their hand up. Yeah. Put your hand up if you've been really angry in the last month. Everyone puts their hand up. Yeah. Put your hand up if you've been really angry in the last week. You've got like half of the hands up in the room. And you do the same thing with sadness. Yeah. And you've got same thing. Everyone's been really sad at some point this year. Yeah. Everyone's been really sad in the, in the last couple of months. And, you know, fair mm. few of us have been sad this week. But none of us are talking about it. Yeah. Well, not none of us. Some of us are. Yeah. <laughs> we are. Like, folks yeah. who come on the Good Blokes Retreat and stuff are saying, yeah. right, this is what I've been struggling with. This is who I want to be. Let's support each other and actually have real conversations around yeah. being the best version of ourselves, you know? I, I have a bit of fun nowadays because I, I, I'm all up for honestly answering questions like, how, how have you been? Me too, yeah. And, I, and you can totally. have a lot of fun with it. And, and, and who, where, oh, I can't remember who it was. Someone asked me recently, and I know, oh, here we go. And how have you been, Brent? And I was like, oh, it's been emotionally dense recently. <laughs> they were like, oh, right, what does that mean? And I was like, do you want to know? <laughs> Yeah, and there's two responses. People go, oh, that's okay, bye, see ya. Yeah. Or they'll go, oh, tell me more about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because sometimes the, the, you know, the mere thing that you've actually opened up yeah. just gives them permission to actually have a real conversation. Yeah. I, so I can't stand it. I don't say I'm good, I'm, I'm fine yeah. a lot anymore. I'll be like, oh, I've got this scratch on my right elbow that's really uh, yeah. bothering me. Um, and I'm really proud of myself for how, how I've made some really tough decisions at work yesterday. How are you? <laughs> and that that's literally how I'm feeling at the moment like I made some tough decisions yesterday I got this bloody scratch from chopping wood in the garden yesterday um, other than that I'm good how are you going <laughs> and people are like oh this is a different kind of a conversation so yeah, yeah. Um, one of the questions I like to ask my guests particularly uh, like yourself where you you have this very sort of um, acute and well focused lens into the world how is it for my looking into the world, being able to clearly see man box behaviors playing out. Yeah. People struggling in amongst that. Uh, how is, you know, and we're, we're talking probably outside of the sanctuary of a retreat or something yeah. like that, just in yeah. everyday stuff, whether it's going to the supermarket and watching the news or yeah. interacting or, you know, catching up for someone for a drink or whatever. Um, how is it for you as you look more deeply into the world and you, and you see certain things go on? Mm. How, how does that wear on you? It, what's interesting for me is I go straight to, you know, what's, what's beneath. So I was actually driving here this morning and there was a young bloke who was sort of standing on top of a hill next to a main road and he put his bike down and he was just yelling at the traffic. And I was like, what, what on earth is going on there? And it was like, he looked upset uh, and he was yelling at the traffic. And I was like, I, I don't quite know what to do here. But with my, you know, having the history of the work that I do and with that lens that I have, mm. um, I just looked at this bloke and thinking like, what, what, is, what does he need here? What, what yeah. is going on for him? So I find myself looking sort of beneath the behavior. I see, I see blokes who are struggling Blokes, blokes who are being a real douchebag, blokes who are being a dickhead, I'm thinking, what is going on for that mm. guy? Is, is it shame? Is it sadness? Is, it, is he feeling a sense of injustice? Because there's something, always something that's, that's driving that unwanted, un, unwanted behavior. Mm. You know, I, I think there's a really tiny proportion of humans who are just 
pathologically bad people. Hmm. Uh, there's a lot of people who are doing things that would be considered bad, but I don't think that makes them bad people. I think there's hmm. there's stuff going Again, on. Again, we're delineating between shame and guilt. Aren't yeah, we? yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. There, there's something there's something going on for that guy. So that's the lens that I kind of look at the world like. Yeah. Oh, why have you chosen to pull out in front of me? That's yeah. that's a bit of a douche move. Hmm. Um, hope you're having an okay day. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it's really, the, the man box thing has really helped me to build a sense of empathy for blokes who are being douchebags. Mm. If that answers your question, I'm not sure. You must, <laughs> surely you must get a bit frustrated at times. Like, come on guys, we can do better oh, than this. Totally, totally. Yeah, there's a, there's a it, it frustrates me with the, that blokes are clearly struggling. The, the one that frustrates me the most is I, is I get an inquiry on my website from a, from a woman. Mm. And I say a woman because it happens probably once every couple of weeks. Um, my boyfriend or my brother or my uncle or whoever would really benefit from your work. Um, he's got this, 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 and this going on. I'm like, yep. He would, he would love it. And, you know, so he's, he's, he's got anxiety. He's really struggling. Uh, He's, he's a coach of a, a hockey team and he, he really wants to do something about it. I'm like, great. He's, he's passionate about all the right things. He's got some personal experience. He's in a position of leadership. Great, let's do something. Let's have the conversation. And he's like, no. Nah. <laughs> Just refusing to yeah. acknowledge that he I don't, has I don't need this shit. any kind of feelings. <laughs> like, oh, that's for, that's for some blokes who are really struggling. It's like, it's not for blokes who are really struggling. It's actually... We all struggle. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's the blokes who aren't struggling so much that actually have the capacity to do something about it. Mm, mm. So if you're feeling well, um, why are you not running you know, some father-son camps with the year six boys at the primary school and, and yeah. trying to have some conversations around manhood with those boys? And if you're feeling really well, why aren't you pulling the 12 blokes aside in your workplace and saying... Yeah, let's make sure we're feeling the th making the three women here feel really included here. Yeah, like why aren't those of us that are in a good place actually being more proactive? Mm. So I think that's what probably frustrates me the most that that blokes aren't being more proactive because you know. And the thing and we is, touched on that earlier, didn't we? That whole when I was talking about you know it's the four in five. What are yeah, they yeah, doing? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and the the thing with mental health is that you know you one out of five that that one out of five things. One out of five uh, blokes will have uh, a, a mental health issue over the next 12 months. Like, how are you going to know which one of the five blokes in your office it's going to be? Yeah. How are you going to know which one of your five mates it's going to be? Hmm. Because if you're not having proactive conversations about hmm. it, you're, you're probably not having the conversation. The, the hmm. thing for me, the reason I got into this work, And how are you going to steer yourself out if you happen to be the one? Yeah. Are you ready to have the... Like, on the Are You OK website, people are like, oh, Are You OK? It's a bit of a waste of time. No one's... The information on how to have the conversation is on the Are You OK website. Yeah. <laughs> I, you look up areyouokday.org, like it's on there. This is how to have the conversation. Mm. Um, so, you know, and that's what Good Blokes Co is about, empowering men to have these conversations more proactively with, with other men who might be struggling, with, with um, you know, people in your workplace, people at your footy club, dads at the local primary school, all, all of those kind of things. Like, why aren't we having really super healthy versions of Bucks parties where we're guiding men to be really clear on what kind of marriage they want to have and how we can support mm. each other and all this kind of stuff? You yes. Know? Let's be proactive. Let's not, let's not wait till he goes, oh, I packed up all my stuff and I'm leaving. I'm like, hang on a sec. You never even told us that you're having a relationship trouble. Shouldn't yeah. you have been telling me about this two years ago? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Mm. Hmm. So the last question I ask all my guests yep. is if I could get, if I, if I could get the whole world to just chill out for five or 10 minutes, <laughs> right? And then Mike, and, and then Mike just uploads a question for every, into the collective consciousness for us all to consider yep. for five or 10 minutes, what would that be? Oh, that's a, there's a few options at country. A question. A question. Um, the question I would want to ask people is, who do you want to be? Hmm. Because I think, I think when we think about that, we don't even have to have a clear answer to that question. But if we're thinking, who do I want to be? Then we've at least got some kind of, you know, true north on, on the compass to guide us yeah. in, in terms of 
you know, making big, big decisions and in terms of guiding us through difficult times in our, in our life. Like, mm. I, I, would, I would love people to be clearer on, you know, who we want to be versus those, those influence, like the man box kind of influences of, mm. of having to be the way that other people expect me to be. Mm. Like, just, just be you. Just be you. <laughs> and and what, what is that? Well, that, that's the thing. It's like that you, when you asked about healthy masculinity, it's like it's diversity. Like we're all yeah. into different things. We all love different things. We all like doing different things. We all have different strengths and, and talents. Um, yeah. let's, let's bring that stuff out, you know. Mm. It's been fun. Great chat. Super enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me on again. It was really good. So if people want to find you, where can they find you? Uh, on the website, which is goodblokes.co. Yep. Um, or on the, on the social media, we're on Instagram and, and Facebook. You can search Good Blokes Co. and you'll, uh, you'll find us, sure enough. Indeed. And it's my, it's my favorite thing to talk about. So if people Is from your right? podcast want to reach <laughs> out and, and have a chat, uh, yeah, I'm always happy to chat more about it. Mike, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Bryn. Cheers. Absolute pleasure.